We're on the round table of the afternoon on the Basque conflict. It doesn't exist, although it does exist on the European territory. It's one of the rare conflicts still in Europe. In the round table, we'll talk about the resolution of the Basque conflict and the protection of negotiators and the historical process because it was unilateral and the need today of implying, involving the two states, the French and the Spanish states, on the consequences of this conflict. On this round table, you'll have Yushu Uruti Gochea, who's a historic um, activist, a key actor in negotiations and getting out of the conflict. Then you have Brian Curran, that I'm delighted to meet again because we were involved in the very first discussions on this conflict resolution. He's a lawyer, expert in conflict resolution, founder of the National Directorate of Lawyers for Human Rights, founding member of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, co-president of Northern Ireland's Commission for the Review of Sentences and founder of the International Contact Group for the Basque Country. We also have with us Véronique Dudouet, who's a research director and expert in conflict resolution at the Beckhoff Foundation. She's a former fellow of the U.S. Institute of Peace that she accompanied and advised civil society in the resolution of the Basque conflict. And we also have Caroline Guibet-Lafay, a philosopher and sociologist, research director at the French National Center for Scientific Research, member of the Emile Durkheim Center, where she leads the European Research Program on Political Engagement and Extra-Parliamentary Actions, and she's an ex expert on the Basque conflict. I will start by giving the floor to Yushu Uruti Shea for him to explain the conflict. And uh, so you have the floor. Thank you, Frédéric. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, by way of introduction, I'd like to thank Michel, Sébastien, and Thomas, the organizers of this uh, event, all participants, and the National Assembly, which welcomes us here for a discussion with our five or four friends about the end of the conflict in the Basque country. Before I go into the core issue, it seems to me important to explain the history so that we can better understand the specificities of our people and our territory, which is today located between two states, the French and the Spanish states. The existence of our people is based on constant things, survival and resistance. We were um, influenced by various civilizations, coveted by different uh, realms. And in particular, when the Kingdom of Navarra um, was um, um, annihilated by the invasion of Castilla in the 16th century, when there was the creation of na nation states in France and Spain, um, the Basque people continue to fight and demand the right to exist as a people. And the question is, is it still alive? Or how is it still alive? The conflict started in the Civil War of 36-39, and more precisely in the Frankist Putsch of 1936. Our country was uh, annihilated perhaps more than the other Spanish state provinces, because we were separatists before we were Republicans. And this is perfectly summed up in the Franco maxim, it is better to have a red Spain than a divided Spain. But Francism forbade 
our culture and language, increased repression against our people. And that is why Itie Yuskarita Askatasuna, which means Basque Country and Liberty and Freedom, the ETA was born to try to revive this repressed people and obtain the right to decide for ourselves about our future. The ETA is the product of a generation that lost the Basque country in the war against Francism. And it's at the same time that the conflict in the Basque country became more and more violent. In the same way as Guernica got the rest of the world to discover fascist barbarism, the Burgos process in 1970 against ETA militants made the world understand that we had a dual real situation. On the one hand, a totalitarian regime that continued, but also there was a national liberation struggle. But the rights that were denied to us during the dictatorship continued to be rejected or denied under the young Spanish democracy. And there was no break that would have clearly put responsibilities on the main actors of the former regime. Since the start, the MLNV wanted to stop a violent, a violent clashes and solve the conflict. And I do regret, with a lot of bitterness, that the end of violent clashes only arrived too late or very late. Violence led to great losses and victims on both sides that we have to acknowledge. The end of violence in itself um, cannot uh, be covered by political considerations. Ethics comes into play. And there was mutual violence and it increased over time, and it was unfortunately not based on some sort of ethical dimension. And both sides did suffer immensely. Very often we say it is easier to start a war than to end it, to put an end to it. Because once a violent conflict has started, there's hatred, and vengeance or revenge that takes over and that changes the initial facts, the origins of the conflict. And it's precisely because of these ethical, um, this ethical thinking that I decided to actively engage in the conflict resolution for the Basque Country. To me, we had to leave a spiral of violence. This process had a number of attempts at negotiations in 1989 in Algiers, 98 in Zurich, in 2005 in Geneva, 2011 in Oslo. But to start the process, we needed various factors to come together. These factors that were indispensable, but not sufficient, unfortunately, as we've seen, could be summed up as such. First of all, the two conflicting parties came to the conclusion that they were in a deadlock. And secondly, they both felt that it was possible to negotiate the end of the conflict. And these two ideas came from much deeper analysis that we developed at the time, and that covered the uh, international geopolitical situation 
at the time. The situation of the European Union and its uh, various interests uh, with the Spanish state, the general situation in the Spanish state, the situation of the social and political forces and civil society in the Basque country, the situation of the uh, national liberation uh, movement, the MLNV, and, if, and of course the situation of the ETA. As a party involved in uh, the search for uh, conflict resolution through negotiations, we had to understand in depth the implications of such a negotiation, that is, with the Spanish state and its representative, the government then in place. We had to understand the fact that these negotiations were not going to be simple and linear, but difficult, and that the Spanish state may not fulfill its promises, and that for the agreements to be confirmed and put in place, we needed two things. An international means of pressure with facilitators, mediators, NGOs, in international institutions, and states. And a second sort of um, lever are people who had to take ownership of the agreements and put a democratic pressure on the Spanish state to force the state to put the agreements in place. At an international level, it took a long time and it was tricky because we had to look for the people and the bodies that could be facilitators, that could help us building this bridge that was necessary to meet the other side, the other party and start discussions. That was a large part of what I had to do. Concretely, the, German, the Algerian government played this role in the negotiations that took place in Algeria in 1989, and I was involved before I got arrested in France. And they guaranteed a territory, the infrastructures, and the security necessary for any type of negotiation. And there was huge work that was carried out uh, from the early two year, no, 2000 by HD, a Center for Humanitarian Dialogue based in Geneva. These men and women that I've known very well, and some have become friends. But it's not here that I should talk about friendships, but the human dimension is always a very important factor in such processes. So these men and women helped us to get the support of European states such as Switzerland, Norway, or France in the processes that took place in Geneva in 2005-2007 and in Oslo between 2011 and 2013. And they gave our delegation the necessary guarantees for us to be able to negotiate to a resolution of the conflict. Unfortunately, France didn't accept this compromise between states. And to me, that had a direct impact because I was uh, sued by French justice as a terrorist organization because I had been actively involved in the MLNV delegation of the Basque country to try to prepare and lead negotiations with the Spanish state in 2005, 2006, and then 2011, 2013. Here, I would like to um, talk, uh, to uh, make an aside, I want to express publicly my gratitude and I, my deep thanks to all the international personalities who mobilized and worked hard 
to organize my defense. This was an aside, but I wanted to stress that point. In the history of these negotiations and beyond the role of facilitators, there are also various aspects to take into account, internal, external, or collateral. And they make sure that you're on the right track or not. And we can give a few examples of things that were very important for the event. For example, when there was a lot of tension with a lot of violence in the Basque country, secret meetings between 2002 and 2004 between militants of the independentist left and the socialist party to prepare these negotiations. Another example, the negative negationist attitude of the Asna president in 2004 at the time of the jihadist um, attacks in Madrid, where a way of opening the negotiations with the Socialist Party that would then come to government. In 2011, another example, the um, attitude of the Rajoy government that was uh, making obst or obstructing the process and that will not uh, follow up on the agreement signed by the previous government of Jose Luis Zapatero. That meant that the Spanish state and the Basque country couldn't solve a conflict, although you had international standards put in place. Because of this U-turn of the Spanish government, the ETA stopped the armed struggle on the 20th of October 2011 and started something unheard of for the resolution of conflicts, a unilateral position. And it's because the whole of uh, the Basque civil society, it's because it was very involved and had the support of the international community that on the 8th of April, 2017, we could have a decommissioning of weapons and the dissolution of the organization. Now here, it is important to stress that the Center for uh, Human, uh, Humanitarian Dialogue was present all along and supported us all along. It's precisely from that center that on the 3rd of May, 2018, I could announce that ETA had uh, dissolved. So we were able to come to the end of the process unilaterally. And that means the end of the armed struggle, decommissioning of weapons and uh, self-dissolution. All questions linked to the recognition of or the acknowledgement of victims, compensations, uh, questions about the prisoners, and all these have to be uh, discussed. It seems to me important now to stop on a very important point. To strike peace with your enemy doesn't automatically mean that you can solve all aspects of a conflict. It is not because there's no violence anymore and peace seems possible that you can solve everything. That is why it is fundamental to solve the consequences of conflicts. In the past few months, there's been a rapprochement about the prisoners, but we're far from having solved all aspects of the... In order for us to achieve peace, we're going to have to have the support of the international community. 
And it is in the best interest of all to uh, deal with all of the questions that would allow us to reach uh, uh, our ultimate goal. Thank you very much for uh, to, to reach a lasting peace and fair peace. Thank you all for your attention, and I pass the floor. Brian. Okay. Good afternoon to uh, to everyone, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to contribute and to be part of this very very important uh, conference, and particularly the session on the Basque Country. I just want to start off with an observation that when I reflect on the role which we played. That's the group that I was working with uh, during the period that we were involved. Um, one is reminded that one's role is largely determined by the, the information one has and a very particular mandate that, that one, one gets and the location where one finds oneself engaging and the the, the point I want to emphasize there is that we were absolutely and totally part of really a track to engagement. Um, and everything that I heard Hossoud discussing and sharing, in particular during the period that, that, that we were involved, that's the people that I was working with uh, from 2004, uh, was, was a, in a completely different context, although it was obviously part and parcel of, of the, same, the same conflict. Uh, just to start off by briefly, I think, recording my, the, my role, my context, and how I got involved, because in a way it, it speaks to the difficulties that, that we had as the international contact group and, and other structures that, that we formed to play the role that we played, which, as I say, is one very much within the Basque country and the stakeholders there. Um, I was really approached by the uh, pro-independence left at the time, Batasuna leaders that traveled to South Africa in 2004 to speak to me about the possibility of playing a role um, but a very defined one, and the intention was that that role be um, related to the release of prisoners when a peace process finally gets to the point where prisoners could be released. And I was approached for that purpose because I had been involved both in South Africa and in Northern Ireland, and the latter for a period of 12 years, dealing with the release of paramilitary prisoners. Um, Ironically, that's the one thing that has not been achieved. Um, and I'll say more about that later. Um, within a sort of two year period, I think from uh, December 2006, the unfolding process, uh, ETA having declared a permanent ceasefire at that stage, um, which then, as we know, that peace process collapsed after the Madrid bomb. I'd become part of a small international group of facilitators, which included uh, Ray Kendall, executive director of uh, Interpol. Uh, sorry, the, he was at that stage an honorary general secretary of, of, of Interpol. Nulo alone, who'd been the uh, head of the... Um, Ombuds, police ombuds body in Northern Ireland, Ruf Mayer, who'd led the apartheid national party negotiations during the peace process in South Africa, and, and myself. Uh, the role that we sort of took up 
during that sort of period after the bomb was an attempt to keep engagement between the different political parties as limited as it was and social groups in northern in 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 the Basque country open in the hope that at some stage there would be a later peace process i should mention um, that in march 2006 a few months after the madrid bomb or was it march 2007 the bomb was in december 2006 if i remember correctly but a few months after the the bomb with the assistance of the south african ambassador to spain Rolf Meyer and I met with um, um, with Alfredo Rubalcaba, as well as the head of security in Spain. And the intention of that meeting, from our perspective, was to try and establish what the chances were of, notwithstanding the bomb, a peace process continuing. We'd heard um, via various contacts work we were doing in the Basque country, that Madrid would be taking a hard line and would not be progressing with negotiations, engagement with, um, with, with ETA at the time, which we knew had been happening through the intervention and the facilitation of the um, Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. Indeed, he did take a hard line, but there was one ray of hope that he, he shared with us he said to us that if we could succeed in persuading the political leadership of the Abitsala left, and obviously that at that point in time was, was better sooner, if we could persuade them to unilaterally declare an end to violence, and if they were to put pressure on Etta to do likewise, and if it were to do that, there would then be the prospect of further engagement and negotiations around the, the issues, which would include obviously political prisoners, truth and reconciliation processes, reconciliation. And certainly that became for us a, a cause which we decided to commit ourselves to and was in fact what fed the engagement that we then continued to have within the Basque country from that moment onwards. What became, well, maybe just to say also that at around about that time, 2007-2008, we were then engaging on an ongoing basis uh, with the leadership of the Abitsala left, including obviously Arnaldo Otegi. And it was quite evident to us, and uh, it was a fact that they themselves had already decided that the time had come for what they described as a new political project for the Basque country, which would be a shift in strategy it would be a focus and a move move from uh, an encouragement to enter that there be a move from violent violence to one of um, engagement and peace process and replacing the bullet with the ballot as as people so often refer to it we had common ground then um, that this group of us we had no official standing, but we were, as I said, engaging with, with various parties in the Basque country. What became very evident, and I think everybody was aware of it at the time, and certainly was the message we were, we were getting from the political leadership in the Basque country, that is of the Abitsala left, that there were huge challenges, and understandably so, in persuading Etta that the time had come for a permanent unilateral ending of the armed struggle. The fact that it was unilateral was obviously a major issue. 
it had to be unilateral because as I, ind as I indicated earlier on, Madrid had taken a position that from their, as we understood it, and certainly as uh, Rubakaba had shared with us, that they were not going to negotiate, although I understand and know that they did subsequently, but certainly that was the position they took from us. So our understanding at that point in time was that uh, there would have to be a unilateral termination of the arms struggle. The big question was, having created a vacuum and the arms struggle being certainly a critical core strategy of ETA at the time, if that were to be removed, what could replace that? What could move into that vacuum space? What we had in South Africa during our peace process was massive international support. There was virtually not a country in the world that did not support the liberation movements and the actions against the apartheid state. In Northern Ireland, there was also international support and certainly, as we all know, the role of the United States, in particular, President Clinton, was critical. From our perspective, and certainly our experience at that time, was that there was not, and there were not prospects of verbal, outspoken, active support for a peace process from the international community in the Basque country particularly at that time. We know that uh, Madrid's strategy was a simple one. Their script was that Eta Abitsala left, pro-independence left, uh, was not a political cause, that Eta was nothing more than a criminal group of bandits, uh, and that being a terrorist activity, being a terrorist organization, Spain should be left on their own to deal with it, and that any international pressure would be unwelcome. So the question that we were then confronted with at the time was, how does one create international support? At the time, we were obviously aware that there was work being done by the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. I had direct contact very secretly, confidentially, with one person from that organization. Um, he made it known in no uncertain terms to me that if Madrid knew about the engagement with me in particular, uh, it would be a massive problem for the center. So. But we, we, we certainly did share information with one another. But the need to get vocal international support then fed into the idea and the strategy of creating a declaration which would enjoy international support. And this really was the first step of, I suppose, the creation of non-governmental interventions to support the, um, the peace process in the Basque country. That declaration that was scripted, and um, I will just want to read that declaration in a short while, that declaration became known as the Brussels Declaration. It took on a dimension much greater than that we ever, ever anticipated. The, as I said, the purpose was to clean international support. And what we did was we identified 20 human rights organizations and or individuals prominent internationally. And amongst them were five um, Nobel Peace Laureates. They included the likes of John Hume, Archbishop Des Desmond Tutu, the Nes Nelson Mandela Foundation, Mary Robinson, President F.W. de Klerk, the last apartheid president of South in South Africa, um, 
as well as Albert Reynolds, who was the past Taoiseach Prime Minister in the uh, Republic of Ireland. And the, the declaration essentially read as follows, that we the undersigned welcome and commend the proposed steps and new public commitments of the Basque pro-independence left, of Itzala left, to exclusively political and democratic means and a total absence of violence to attain its political goals. Fully carried out, this commitment can be a major step in ending the last remaining conflict in Europe. By that stage, the Abertzala left um, political leadership in the Basque country had officially publicly endorsed the Mitchell principles of democracy and nonviolence. And the Mitchell principles are ones that came through the Northern Ireland peace process. The Brussels Declaration went on, and this I think was a very significant and important paragraph, went on to say, we note the expectation that the coming months may present a situation where the commitment to peaceful, democratic, and nonviolent means becomes an irreversible reality. And this I want to stress. To that end, we appeal to ETA to support this commitment by declaring a permanent, fully verified ceasefire. Such a declaration, appropriately responded to by the Spanish government, would permit new political and democratic efforts to advance, differences to be resolved, and lasting peace attained. Now, that declaration um, was then presented, I presented that declaration in Brussels in March 2010, and then it became known as the Brussels Declaration. Um, the commitment that was requested from ETA, uh, the appeal from, with, from that group of 20 highly respected international individuals um, to ETA, from our perspective, became key. And one of the reasons for that, in fact, the main reason for that, and that was what our thinking was at the time, was that if ETA were to respond positively to that plea, any future commitment to a permanent ceasefire would be a commitment to that, to the international community, to that group of individuals that made the plea to ETA, and not a commitment or an undertaking to this, to 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 this to Madrid, to the state of Spain. Subsequently, uh, and as I said, that was then in March two thousand and and ten. In October 2010, after doing further work on the ground in the Basque country, a decision was taken during that period, and that gave rise to the second non-governmental intervention to form a non-governmental international contact group. And we know what role contact groups play, international contact groups play in peace processes. Our attempts to try and solicit and get support from organizations, including the European Union and the United Nations and other international governments to be part of this came to naught. And for that reason, as I say, we again decided to establish a non-governmental contact group, international contact group. And in October 2010, after a deep consultation process in the Basque country, where we met with as many of the political parties as would, as would meet with us, and understandably some would not, particularly the popular party at no stage met with us, but the others did. Not all legs of the Socialist Party met with us, but certainly um, the president of the Socialist Party in the Basque country, 
at that stage, who we know was a brave man, um, met with us, but other political parties did as well, and also the trade unions and social groups. And we sought a mandate from the parties, the, the groups, the stakeholders in the Basque country to form this international contact group. And through that, we then got a broad mandate. And that mandate, as part of Track 2, was to enable, expedite, and facilitate the achievement of political normalization in the Basque country. We defined political normalization as an inclusive and transparent political dispensation based on an exclusively democratic means in the total absence of violence or threats of violence from whatever source in which the rule of law is supreme and in which the civil and political rights of all are protected and promoted. There were a number of essential requirements for the achievement of political normalization as defined, and the achievement of some of those were outside of our remit, outside of any power that we had. The two critical ones, which are still remain unattended to, is the issue of um, political prisoners, the issue of exiles, um, as well as the question of uh, some of the special security measures. And uh, I think mandated state-led uh, reconciliation processes of the likes of truth and reconciliation commissions, which are referred to as consequences of violence, as, as I said, still not attended to. But there were some issues certainly that, that, we, uh, that we could um, attempt to deal with, which, which we did. And those were defined mainly as um, an ongoing attempt through the mandate which we, which we had to try and achieve a permanent and unilateral ceasefire by ETA, which was to include all activities related in any way to its campaign of violence and intimidation. Um, as well as uh, an independently verifi verifiable international um, an, uh, structure, which would be a uh, decommissioning body to deal with the whole issue of decommissioning at a weapons at, at the right moment. Part of the mandate also was to attempt to set up a table for multi-party negotiations, where the focus would be on addressing the political issues related to the Basque country, related to the uh, to the to political cause, namely the right to to decide own future, the right to self determination, um, and that then became, as I said, the mandate of the would become the mandate of the international contact group. However, in that statement we made as to the establishment of that group, we said the following. We said the endorsers of the Brussels Declaration addressed in unequivocal terms the demands of the international community, which the Brussels Declaration represents. We then said that when ETA declares a unilateral, permanent and verifiable ceasefire, which has as its objective a permanent end to the armed struggle, um, the international contact group would then commence its work. And a key aspect of, of that work was uh, um, part, parts of the mandate I've already mentioned, but critical also was the whole issue of establishing a structure uh, which was hoped at the time would include the governments of both Madrid and Paris, Spain and France, um, around the uh, inter an international verific verification commission uh, for the uh, decommission of, of weapons, as well as the, the as well as the monitoring of that process, as well as processes that would deal with the release of political prisoners. In January 2000 and, 
in January 2011, ETA indeed responded positively to the Brussels Declaration directly to the uh, to those who who were part of that declaration and declared a permanent, verifiable, internationally verifiable um, end to the arms struggle. We believed at the time that that commitment would never be breached because the commitment, as I said earlier, was made to the international community. There was a compact between, from our perspective, our understanding between ETA and the international community. And indeed, it never was. Um, we moved from there to establish, which we committed to do, the International Verification Commission. Yet again, another non-governmental structure, again unilateral, without any support of either Madrid or Paris, because neither Madrid nor Paris responded positively either to the, um, to the Brussels Declaration. And notwithstanding the commitments that were made around, around non-violence, notwithstanding the commitment and the undertaking that we were given when we met with Wakaba way back in uh, 2007, uh, there was no public engagement or commitment from either of those two states to deal with the consequences of the violence. Um, and that really, I think, uh, brings me to the, to the end of, of my, my presentation because I did say that I would limit it to the establishment of these non-governmental private structures. Um, and I think also lesson to be learned from that is one is able to progress peace processes in difficult circumstances where governments refuse to, 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 uh, to, to contribute. Having said that, to achieve all the outcomes which are necessary, it is essential, and that's an important element of this um, session, to be looking at what needs still to be done in order to get both those governments to engage, to deal with the consequences of the violence, something that has to happen. If legacies are not dealt with, and I can tell you as I speak now, that many of the legacies of the conflict in South Africa have still to this day not been dealt with. And uh, we are bearing the consequences of that. And as I speak, I am involved in some of those processes at the moment, more than 25 years after the end, after the beginning of our new democratic state. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. Uh, Véronique Dupuis. Je laisse la parole à Véronique Duboué, s'il vous plaît. Uh, thank you, Véronique Duboué. You've got the floor. Thank you, Frédéric. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you very much to the organizers for the bravery and the energy they put into organizing uh, this uh, symposium. I would like to speak about my own contribution to the organizing of this session by uh, recommending several speakers who I hope will be contributing very relevant statements uh, to this discussion on the need and the obstacles uh, for uh, conflict uh, resolution, uh, armed conflict resolution. My own contribution to this round table on the Basque country will address uh, several subjects. Uh, very briefly, since it's already been mentioned, I'd like to address the unprecedented nature of the Basque process that led to disarmament and the dissolution of the armed uh, group known as ETA. But I'd also like to address the internal dynam dynamics within the independent movement that have allowed the advent of a pacifist um, political movement. And I'd also like to speak about the social dynamic and the key role played by Basque society in the moving forward over the last few years. I'd like to also mention the presence of uh, 
NGOs and other prison, uh, international uh, structures, and also other uh, the presence of uh, key issues that still need to be addressed and resolved in order to achieve a sustainable peace in the Basque country. Uh, before we address uh, these issues, however, allow me to uh, draw a general picture on the subject of this conference, which is dialogue among uh, enemies or a uh, negotiation between enemies. I myself have worked as a research and expert and trainer within the Berghoff Foundation uh, based in Germany. Uh, Berghoff Foundation is an NGO based on the uh, resolution of uh, asymmetric conflicts in a nonviolent way. That is to say, conflicts between governments and one or several armed groups. Uh, our mission at this foundation are to work on the principle whereby there is no military or police solution to what is a conflict of a political nature. In fact, uh, uh, armed uh, conflicts uh, based on political claims uh, by marginalized or oppressed groups cannot be put down by force. On the contrary, not only uh, will the stakeholders continue to be involved, but all the people affected by the conflict, in particular the victims, need to be considered as stakeholders holders in any solution that is sought and reached. We believe that the end of a conflict, if it's negotiated, is uh, more equitable and more durable because it would address the deep causes of violence, such as discrimination and inequality. And uh, this also would lead to a democratization process, decentralization of power, or uh, major structural reforms. I would now like to share with you some of my thoughts uh, as regards the unprecedented nature of the solution of the armed conflict in the Basque country. It is frequently described as a unilateral process. The story of the Basque conflict in the north of Spain and south of France over the past 40 years has been characterized by political violence and by an acute polarization as well as citizen activation around uh, peace. Uh, after several failed uh, peace uh, processes over several years, as uh, Juchu has just described to us, uh, we had the uh, peace conference that was uh, held in San Sebastián in 2011 a uh, conference at which various eminent international personalities participated, including the ex-secretary uh, of the UN, uh, Kofi Annan. This conference uh, gave uh, new strength to conflict resolution. And through the IAT, uh, 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 international recognition took place for the need to solve this conflict. They requested the armed branch of uh, ETA to implement a number of specific and definitive final actions uh, as part of the peace process. And they also asked the Spanish state to also act along the same lines by opening up negotiation channels. And three days afterwards, uh, it uh, announced a unilateral ceasefire on a final definitive basis, and in turn called upon Spain and France to open talks. As we have just heard, unfortunately, the Spanish government did not uh, respond to this initiative and remained opposed to any direct negotiations with ETA, including uh, due to the political changes happening in Madrid and to the advent into power of a new conservative government that insisted clearly on the fact that one cannot negotiate with terrorists. The following years were marked by an absence of visible progress uh, within the political establishment in Spain, and I'd also say that for France, and in that in spite of internal progress and progress within the Basque society itself, which I will later describe. Between 2011 and 2017, we saw a situation which was somewhat absurd, where an armed organization declares it's ready to commit to a disarmament uh, process and to dissolve itself in favor of political dialogue without receiving the least response on the part of the government's concern. And in that case, of course, uh, as uh, Ryan called Abertale, the nationalist left was uh, forced to rethink or redesign the traditional approach to armed conflict and thus undertook a non-conventional process of demobilization through a dialogue, not with the Spanish or French governments uh, to the south and to the north, but through a tripartite uh, uh, 
uh, dialogue with its own basis, uh, with the local politicians and other Basque institutions, as well as with the civil society in Basque country as well. This uh, non-conventional peace process uh, in 2018 uh, reached uh, the uh, uh, solution of a declaration by IEAT recognizing the progress uh, since 2011 in order to reach a just and equitable peace in the region and in particular through the complete uh, disarmament of uh, ETA, who got rid of its uh, arsenal in 2018, and the dissolution of the armed movement or branch of ETA in 2018. However, the dialogue between enemies, in spite of the persistence of Madrid in refusal to negotiate with the independent movement, has unfortunately blocked the possibility of achieving solutions to other dimensions of the conflict, such as solving the situation of political prisoners, uh, addressing the victims of the conflict, uh, starting a negotiation or reconciliation process, and addressing the uh, social and political future of the Basque country. I would now like to address a somewhat unknown part of the peace process, and that is of the internal dynamics. The stakeholders who have driven the dialogue from within and who have taken strong personal risks uh, for the sake of peace. In my own country, in various countries, in my own uh, work in various countries, I've seen that conflict resolution, armed conflict resolution, shows that uh, violence uh, can only be solved uh, when the major stakeholders make an active choice to change paradigms. That is to say, to demilitarize uh, armed conflict and to start a sincere dialogue with their enemies. Such a transition requires on the part of leadership the driving of an internal dialogue in order to convince their own militants and the most uh, extremist of them to accept a change. In the best country, after uh, considerable efforts that uh, reached a negotiated solution, as Jose Julio reminded us, the independence movement opted for an altogether different track. The leadership, including those that were in prison, uh, opted for a strategic revision of the strategic uh, of their historic uh, objectives and decided to listen to their community and to take due note of the changes demanded by uh, civil uh, society in the Basque country. This led to exclusively peaceful means in order to pursue their struggle uh, toward uh, uh, self-determination and their uh, objectives. This strategy could not have been developed without a strong capacity of a nucleus of people within the actual movement itself. And thus the armed organization, ETA, initiated an inclusive and participative dialogue amongst all of its uh, uh, militants, those who were in jail, those who were in exile, and those who were active, in order to ensure that this decision was taken together. No militant could subsequently say that he or her was not consulted. I do not have the time to provide uh, more detail about this. I was told that this uh, was the inclusive dialogue, but if I uh, recall, I recall that toward the end of this process, around 2018, 2017, 2018, there were more than 3,000 members and 1,000 political cadres who had been consulted and who voted for demobilization of the Italian organization. And this is what led to the announcement of the decommissioning of the arms in 2018 and a uh, declaration of empathy to all of the victims of the armed conflict. Uh, as regards the social dynamic, I would also like to address the role of the Basque civil society, which uh, played a uh, very important role in the uh, peace process. Many organizations from uh, civil society have uh, taken uh, uh, part uh, in declaring uh, their preference for a nonviolent solution in the Basque country. Uh, let me uh, mention two organizations that played an instrumental role uh, in uh, peace building. It's important to souligner l'appui au processus de paix initié par les mouvements sociaux El Cari, puis Lo Cari. It is important to stress the support in the south country, the south of the country, that is the Spanish Basque country, of two movements, well, one in the south, one in the north. And there were a lot of public initiatives 
with these two organizations that enable civil society to come up with concrete uh, demands. And uh, there was, for example, a social forum in 2013 where 12 recommendations were prepared uh, to solve the uh, judicial, security, humanitarian, and social aspects of the conflict. There were several other conferences afterwards with an inclusive participation of civil society, but also of a large number of elected uh, representatives of the Basque political parties. And these conferences were a mechanism for national dialogue between different stakeholders on the issue of uh, disarmament, uh, political prisoners, victims, or even how to organize reconciliation. And this space of constructive debate and proposals held by experts for example, from Northern Ireland, enabled the population to uh, be, uh, take ownership of the peace process. And you have uh, what we call artisans de paix, so um, peace uh, promoters in France that helped the process and enabled the checking of disarmament by the ETA. The ETA had stated right in 2011 that it wanted to disarm, but couldn't do it because governments didn't want to abandon the anti-terrorist struggle and didn't accept the full capitulation of the movement. But to get out of the deadlock, um, several personalities from civil society in the French Basque country committed or are known for their nonviolent stance uh, decided to help the process and they exchanged letters with the ETA and they convinced people that civil society should be in charge of disarmament from a technical and political point of view, with, of course, the support of international observers. This initiative uh, concluded, was completed on the 8th of April with 3.5 tons of weapons and munitions given to the French authorities, thanks to information provided by the peace promoters. And there were 172 witnesses from civil society. This was a model that enabled civil society to be fully involved with 20,000 citizens uh, that, could, uh, that were present on the day and celebrated the event with several uh, personalities from the cultural, social, and political life of the Basque country. It is important to uh, state that the beginning of a sustainable peace in the Basque country is only beginning. Um, there must be the development of a nonviolent culture, work on um, the past, the history, memory, what happened and to look at the international dimension now very briefly, although it was mentioned before by Brian, I'd like to say that without a formal and official peace process without international uh, mediation, my organization was involved with other NGOs to compensate for that uh, lack and they helped in transforming the Basque country with a lot of involvement from the public and private um, spheres to help the political and social Basque organizations for them to keep the momentum up to 2018. I was privileged enough to see uh, a division of labor that was really efficient because everybody brought something to the process and helped the transformation. Brian talked about the international contact group, the uh, verification commission, 
and the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. We, as the Berger Foundation, we provided technical support and strategic support to various actors of the Basque Country. We feel that our support helped in the strategic uh, directions of the movement and help those who in the movement were in favor of peace and a hope that we strengthen trust and uh, develop the expertise of civil society organizations because they became the agents of change on both sides of the border. So once again, there was no international mediation, but an organization of support by third parties that was vital. It was done in trust, confidence, and full respect of the local population. To conclude, I'd like to ask the question of the challenges that still remain. I'll talk about two, but there are many others. And I'd like to talk about the need to complete the disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration in the Basque country. Because this DDR process, which is true to any armed conflict, is fundamental to peace processes in order to find a, a, a long-lasting solution. The DDR must be seen in, with a view to solving all aspects of the conflict. And the dismantling of ETA should um, be conducive to dialogue, solve the problems of prisoners and victims, and uh, help towards reconciliation. Because otherwise, we would miss the historic opportunity to solve all aspects of the conflicts. And that's why all social forum for us since 2013 have asked for that the Basque conflict is not to be seen just from the point of view of violence, but in all its aspects. And we have to reintegrate the, um, the fighters, the belligerents. In a normal case, when there's an armed conflict and coming to a peace process, there are different mechanisms of transitional justice to solve the legal issues linked to the involvement in the conflict. And where there is no uh, negotiated settlement, which is the case between France and Spain and the Basque Country, then they have to take measures of transitional justice of a sort. And the problem is that the effort of some individuals were not acknowledged by the French government nor the Spanish government, and that was really um, damaging. So I would like to invite French elected officials to really do their utmost to solve Solve the, or to overcome the last obstacles of the Basque country, in particular the condition um, of uh, former prisoners, of militants, and they should um, listen to victims and promote dialogue so that we can build peace and democracy in the region all together. Thank you for your attention. Hello? Tu m'entends? Can you hear me? Says Frédéric. Thomas Lacoste. Yes, we can hear you. I have concluded my contribution. Sorry, I couldn't hear anymore. Thank you very much, Véronique. And I want to give the floor to Caroline Guibet Lafay for her. Her contribution. Good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. A large part of what I said was, uh, I was going to say, it has already been mentioned. 
But I'd like to come back to the topic and stress perhaps better the role of the two states in this uh, conflict of the Basque country. So I'll come back to this, but not providing details on the process that took place some time ago, because it's from the second half of the 70s that the first uh, contacts um, started between uh, the government and the, uh, organi the Basque organization between December 1976 and January 1976. And they wanted to have a sort of ceasefire to organize the reintegration of prisoners. It was just after the fall of Francism and a democratic transition in Spain. Then I'd like to come back to various periods in the process just to show how the there were no there was no trust in particular with the Spanish government. For example, if you take the discussions that took place between uh, 86 and 89, you see that at the end of the discussions, um, there was a, a break because one of the representatives of the government, José Luis Gambrera, forgot to mention one of the points of the agreement between uh, Harry Batasuna and the PSOE, and that led to uh, the end of the ceasefire. And we saw that while the negotiations were quite important, but they were interrupted because it was like a promise that was not uh, fulfilled and there was no trust any longer between the interlocutors or the various parties. This trust is really important because if you want to transform enemies into opponents, you must have trust or can a certain degree of trust between the parties. After the break in the discussions, other meetings uh, took place but we noted that it was a unilateral process, but it was unilateral since 1991, because that's the time when the ETA decided to have a um, ceasefire for two months in a process towards peace. But the Spanish government always wanted guarantees that from the armed organization were totally unacceptable. So this approach by the ETA to start the process on their own in September 98 and have another unlimited um, ceasefire. But then again, the ASNA government wanted the ASNA government didn't really follow a suit. But at the end of the 90s, there was a sort of softening uh, in the positions and a ray of hope. And like Yusu said, secret negotiations then took place in Switzerland between a representative of the ASNA government and the ETA, but they couldn't come to an agreement because then again there was no trust between the parties because in parallel to the negotiations the ETA members were arrested including those that were involved in the discussions and militants were uh, named. As you said earlier on, and I can't go into the detail of all that, in the important phases of the process, 
towards the end of the conflict, you have 2005, 2007, which is a period where the parties will try to um, increase their demands. For example, Zapatero the, and its government said, the, the Spanish government said, you have to give up weapons, which was difficult to accept uh, by the ETA. And the ETA uh, demanded a permanent ceasefire, the recognition of a large Basque country with the south in Spain and in the north in France. So it was a time when uh, each of the two parties were trying to impose conditions that were virtually unacceptable to the other party. However, in November 2006, there were agreements signed that started or that paved the way for a political agreement. But the context was that the ETA Um, organized uh, an attack of the um, Barajas airport in Madrid, which led to more repression by the Zapatero government from January 2008. And there were, and there were a lot of uh, measures uh, taken. Last two phases of the process, the IET conference and then the disarmament. The IET conference, after that, ETA publicly stated that it was giving up the armed struggle, but the uh, Rajoy government uh, remained attentist didn't want to commit itself. And this uh, wait and see position uh, lasted for some time. You mentioned the work of the peace uh, promoters, which is a quite a unique uh, feature for clandestine organizations and their disarmament. But the governments, both in France and in Spain, were quite surprising. Madrid wanted uh, just full surrender without any compensation. And the French government said that the disarmament had to be unilateral and just proved that um, people uh, had been involved in the armed struggle. But the French government um, sort of stepped back and helped with the disarmament process, whilst in the south, the Spanish government considered that the only way out for ETA was to dissolve uh, the organization and uh, fully disarm. And there was no transaction possible and no concession from the government. And one can ask, why the Spanish state didn't want to be involved in the process of dismantling or that could have helped it politically. But what was the interest of the Spanish government to adopt such a stance, such a firm stance? Well, firm is not the right word, in fact, rigid stance because basically it blocked the disarmament process of the clandestine organization, especially because um, Mr. Rajoy said, or talked to the organizations of victims, said that the self-dissolution of ETA would lead to no compensation and ETA was still presented as a terrorist organization in the media and by government. Comme on l'a vu et comme Yusuf en a fait les frais, en dépit de son autodissolution, l'organisation continue de faire les frais de politique antiterroriste importante puisque on a constaté 
l'arrestation de Yosso en 2019 et celle euh, en 2020 et en 2020 euh, d'autres militants de l'organisation, y compris euh, de, enfin, de, de militants qui, qui étaient organisés dans, enfin, qui, qui, comment dire, euh, accusés d'être euh, impliqués à différents niveaux de l'organisation. Alors, euh, ces éléments chronologiques rappelés, je vais euh, m'interroger sur la possibilité, en l'occurrence, enfin, dans le cadre du conflit basque, de passer de ce qu'on peut appeler l'ennemi à l'adversaire, puisque avec l'autodissolution de TA, au fond, s'ouvre la possibilité que euh, des ennemis absolus euh, d'hier puissent devenir des, ce qu'on appellerait des adversaires courtois, au moins euh, s'agissant des représentants du gouvernement d'une part et de ceux qui furent euh, les membres du groupe clandestin, leurs responsables et leurs représentants dans les négociations. Jusqu'alors, euh, les membres de TA constituaient la, la bête à abattre, si on peut dire, l'ennemi euh, dont l'existence menaçait le bon ordre et auquel on opposait un refus de dialoguer. Euh, on était dans une espèce d'impasse discursive, et j'en ai souligné tout à l'heure les écueils en fait, par le manque de confiance qu'il pouvait y avoir parfois entre les interlocuteurs. Néanmoins, euh, la démocratisation consiste dans un processus de régulation de la violence physique et la pacification des rapports politiques. Par conséquent, cette pacification suppose un statut d'interlocuteur légitime. Meant that uh, the opposite members must be seen as fully fledged representatives and to find common ground despite differences. So, conversely, an authoritarian regime, authoritarian regime, is par un curieux retour des choses, pourrait-on dire, finit par caricaturer le concept d'ennemi et dégrader. Actually, kind of becomes a caricature of an enemy. And they use any means to achieve their, their ends. So in an authoritarian regime, the enemy that is created so in a democratic system, the ideas that we achieve reconciliation with our opposite party. And that's the ideal situation. And so instead, you don't see each other as arch enemies, but just as an opposite party with whom you can discuss and speak. So this change of mentality from going from mere enemy to adversary would lead to a first reconciliation. And then we would have new way, new political policies, new rules of play, if you will, and then leading to peace. Another way of proceeding is to stop persecuting people in a selective manner. And no matter what party the militants, the activists, or their families are, well, then we agree not to punish them needlessly. So, here, the, the, the strategy is to come to achieve a compromise. And Going, so changing this attitude of enemy to adversary can help facilitate the peace process. So it's important to say that when we talk about victims and their families, there are victims not only, uh, there are victims on both sides. Because the Spanish state uh, has repeatedly, continually harassed uh, the Basque people and their family and families and victims. 
And so it's important to do things in according to process in the correct manner. But basically, when you st still see the enemy as such, when you continue to persecute, when you continue to arrest, you continue to have a, a confrontation uh, or cleavage, if you will, or a gap between uh, one side and the Spanish government. So basically, in order to move forward, in order to even think of coming to achieving a reconciliation, you need to stop thinking, uh, having this mentality of arch enemy. But we see that this has not happened because we continue to have people being arrested. So whether in today's democracy, whether you're talking about France or Spain, we see that, uh, you know, it would be nice if people who were once considered enemies of state could just be considered political. So those who have been labeled as former members, former terrorists, are affected by the fact that they're kind of labeled as enemies whether they be Spanish, French, Basque. We saw that in November 2010, a victims organization um, created, came up with an idea of being able to forgive without Impu with impunity. So the, the basis for this went back to the Soviet era in uh, the, the USSR, where were uh, targeted. So people, so the state would label people who were known enemies, but who uh, were, we could anticipate uh, what they were going to do. So here, instead of calling them the enemy, uh, we see that they're a risk. And so we see that there's a sort of cooperation, anti-terrorist cooperation between France and Spain. And so also, just as we have in, in the former Soviet bloc, you know, one asks themselves, is it a good idea to continue to uh, target or harass certain former members of ETA if it's not actually just a uh, way of maintaining supremacy over them in disguise, or if it's a sort of political and ideological hegemony at both the national and international levels? So, now we have to uh, see what kind of harassment is uh, is used against these former uh, activists. Some are prisoners uh, who don't get pardoned despite their health issues. Uh, we have uh, one person who's known as Susper who wouldn't get a suspended sentence even though he suffers from multiple sclerosis. Henry Parot is still in prison after 30 years, uh, after having served 30 years. And Xistor, Frederick Haramburu, uh, was just um, released from prison, but still wears, after 30 years, uh, serving 30 years, but still wears an, electric, an electronic bracelet. So with all of this, we see that there, there are enemies in a democracy so they they really have a, this they're they're branded with this image of enemies in a democracy so how can we look to the future of the basque country so 
a long-lasting peace means that we would have to have some preconditions to to peace. One of our conditions is to one of the, recognize the fact that we are actually in a struggle. In an open conflict, reconciliation requires that you have to establish a date for reproachment and establishing an ideal point to begin this reproachment, which means that you, you really need to find uh, the ideal moment or ripeness of the area. And this point is reached when there, it is too high a cost to continue the fight. And both parties, or all parties, need to be ready to take the risk of a reproachment. And this is interesting in the context of Basque country politics. But it's a challenge because there's still a significant portion of the Spanish population that's against it. Especially, for instance, at the University of the Basque Country, there are people that are supported by victims' associations who want to actually challenge the very definition of a conflict. It's almost a form of negationism. These sides maintain that there hasn't been a conflict in the Basque country in the last decades. And I am not as optimistic as Véronique, because if we think about long-lasting peace in the Basque country, because indeed there hasn't been a civil war or uh, international conflict, but the uh, one side in the Basque country uh, disagreement, if you will, is supported by uh, a significant portion of the Spanish population and two states. But living together peacefully means that you need to have a reconciliation. But in order for that reconciliation ha to happen, we need to make sure that the five points of the ro roadmap um, of the International Peace Agreement of October 2011 were satisfied. But as often happens, the reconciliation means that you also have to recognize that wrong, wrongdoing has happened in the past. Also, uh, some of the negotiations were done under pressure from outside parties. So, in a way, it's perceived as a sort of negative piece rather than something positive. And so uh, the, that means that uh, dominant groups that get widespread support uh, can impose their will uh, in the name of peace. But those that are oppressed or harassed uh, or disadvantaged are less uh, have less to gain from maintaining the status quo. As I said earlier, some victims' organizations deny the fact that there was a conflict in the Basque country. But also, there's a sort of selective history being written about the Basque country by certain people. So, 
when we talk about historic the, the, the history uh, we need to think about to acknowledge the fact that there is an armed conflict and also we would have to do away with the sort of unilaterality this one-sidedness excuse me that was characteristic of the the la the end of the last cycle of violence but we saw that the um the, the winners, so to speak, or the uh, the side that, that won is the side that is, uh, whose point of view is being written in uh, the annals of history. And so this continued way of viewing history is a, a block to reconciliation. And it is the idea that is prevalent uh, at the upper levels of Spanish government. It's also important, the, the role of victims is also something that's not negligible. So rehabilitation is an issue that's going to uh, be important in the future. Um, rehabilitation and, and also for the former uh, people who are involved in this conflict to re-enter society. That is also something that's going to have to be dealt with. So any type of truth and reconciliation uh, initiative uh, has a hard time getting off the ground in this case. And I'm not very optimistic about the future in a sense in the Basque country because it's really, it's imbalance, there's an imbalance because all of the, the meetings that are aiming towards uh, coming together between and having a reproach, uh, truth and reconciliation between those who committed uh, the violence and the victims of violence uh, haven't gone the way we would hope and they've also affected the way history is being written. It's important to have a strong political support or international support for this to be successful. But to really, truly go from former arch enemies to uh, adversaries, you need to have popular support and real political will. Some people in the Basque country want to achieve reconciliation, but for successful and lasting peace, we need to have certain mechanisms that favor reconciliation in place. You need to be able to look into what happened in the past and yes, we could possibly have a dialogue between victims and the people who committed the violence and achieve a sort of restoration and reconciliation. But we saw that up until 2014, for instance, a group but was met with such uh, vociferous uh, objections, uh, he had to, to leave politics. And in fact, there were even people in, own, in his own side that were against it. So previous attempts have really been stymied or not gotten off the ground. 
So reconciliation can't come from the outside in. It has to be initiated by people who are really on the ground and directly involved, which means that's not just enough to have a, a, a process that's supported by civil society. And uh, this process has to take place uh, within the Basque country and within the Spanish uh, state uh, through the process I've just mentioned. And I'll stop then by mentioning the need to provide uh, security for those who are considered the most radical amongst the terrorists and also for proper treatment of those considered to be political terror, uh, political prisoners. Thank you very much for your attention. Would anybody like to react uh, to uh, these uh, last uh, statements we've heard? Uh, one of you uh, who may have already taken the floor uh, can also react in particular, if anybody would like to react to the last statement we've just heard, which gives us a sense of perspective to a number of issues we were addressing. Can you hear me properly? Hearing? Apparently nobody is asking to speak. Uh, how about uh, Brian? Would you like to take the floor, Brian? Well, just uh, a couple of words uh, to add to what uh, Caroline just said, and that is that uh, um, I too, um, of course, interested in the reconstructive future for all. And I'd like to underscore three aspects that uh, Caroline underscored, and that is the need for a political wheel, uh, popular support, and of course, I would add international support in this particular endeavor. So, um, in order to change paradigms, uh, the point of view, which unfortunately persists, uh, which is that of uh, winners and vanquished, uh, needs to be changed. If you want to build a future in the Basque country, this uh, future has to be one where everyone participates in building it. And of course, it's not going to be an easy task because unfortunately, when you uh, take a step back in history, uh, you uh, uh, still have a hard time um, lining up uh, your... Uh, perceptions of history. This is the case in Spain with the civil war. And of course, of a more recent uh, conflict, it's even more difficult. But in any case, I think that these three points that have been addressed are important. And I believe that in order to build a future in the Basque country, we need to involve all of those who uh, are on our side, we could call them, uh, but uh, uh, who continue to be uh, distributed, but everyone has to participate in building this future. I'm uh, waiting for other people to take the floor, but I do have some comments. Uh, since I attended the IETE conference, I remember well the words uh, spoken by Kofi Annan at the time, who said, uh, we've got at least 20 years ahead of us uh, for this process. And I remember saying 20 years is a long time. And now it's just uh, 10 years ago. So uh, part of the road uh, has been traveled, but a long path remains ahead. And I agree with uh, uh, Josu uh, on the fact that we need all stakeholders to be involved and also the international community in order to pressure the French and Spanish governments. Uh, things might be moving a bit on the French side, but certainly not enough and uh, moving in silence. So that's always complicated because obviously uh, when people make choices and it's difficult to convince uh, those who haven't participated, when you're convincing them to participate in a non-violent way, you need to have good arguments as to the good choice. Unfortunately, the acts on either side are not sufficiently eloquent in order to prove that the choices are the good ones. Obviously, there's massive expectations, high level also of impatient that healed the prisoners, the victims on both sides. Um, and I think that uh, admitting responsibility is something where high uh, placed people at the political level would need to understand the problem. And of course, uh, start by needing to understand it. And as uh, uh, Joshua just uh, said, 
we are still at the stage where the winners are submitting the vanquished. And of course, uh, the issue is to know how youth in the Basque country can uh, turn the page, live a period of peace, social cohesiveness, and try to, uh, as you described, uh, uh, reach a page of uh, reconciliation where we write the future uh, together. That's where the whole problem is. And as a parliamentarian, uh, we have uh, spoken about a young uh, a member of the uh, popular conservative party in Spain, Partido Popular, and I too have paid a very high price as well in my own career. And uh, we've uh, seen uh, also a French politician, Manuel Valls, uh, paying a high price for his uh, political interests as well. So, uh, sorry for bringing this up, but of course, uh, of course, uh, things started moving once uh, 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 that horse uh, left uh, the government and Bernard Castaneuve uh, accepted to uh, participate actively in the arms restitution progress. All of us were there at five o'clock in the morning when the operation was launched. Thank God it went well at the end of the day. But uh, of course, a lot of it still remains to be written. So uh, the comments that have been made on either side are very important. And I think solidarity and collective thinking are important as well. Uh, I don't know if uh, we still have 10 years of history to write, as Kofi Annan said or predicted. But in any case, uh, many, many pages were to be written. Who would like to take the floor? Just who's speaking, yes, I'd like to point out something that's very important uh, that I uh, started mentioning, and that is that you cannot reconstruct a country based on vengeance and on hate. You cannot uh, use the victims in order to defend your present policies. Uh, that doesn't work, and that's not going to help uh, for those years ahead and for the long path ahead of us. I uh, definitely share your viewpoint, Josu. It's indeed uh, uh, a strong and positive addition to what uh, I have said. I see that uh, uh, we're still not in the right frame of mind, so to speak. Brian, Veronique, would anybody else like to take the floor? Yes, I'd like to quickly react to what we've uh, heard and to what uh, Caroline said. I think it's uh, very important for us to do some serious thinking about uh, changing our perception from enemy to adversary. As she clearly said, there are many reasons whereby the Spanish government prefers having an enemy than an adversary. It's uh, easier, so to speak, uh, to crush or to weaken someone you describe as an enemy, as an armed movement, than to uh, win against a political adversary on the on political. The same thing happened in Gaza recently, where many governments in general would prefer to describe uh, uh, their opponents as uh, uh, enemies rather than as adversaries. So uh, possibly I've given uh, an excessively optimistic view of the future. Maybe that's my natural optimism uh, taking over. But uh, I just like to say that the problem is one where the uh, government has uh, sold a terroristic uh, perception, an anti-terroristic perception to the public. And it's very difficult to backtrack on that, to dial back on uh, your uh, statements when you've been telling the people for 20 years, for 30 years, that the adversary was a criminal, was a terrorist. It's very difficult to turn back on those statements and to reverse the perception. And all of a sudden, to start uh, uh, looking at uh, your adversary, no longer as a terrorist, but as a political opponent. I believe that uh, uh, what is also very important, although maybe I didn't say it very clearly when I spoke about 20% uh, of the BDR, uh, the uh, reintegration process, uh, uh, disarmament, uh, demobilization, etc. Uh, the militants should also be considered as part of a peace process, peace solution, not just in terms of reintegration, but also part of act active participation in the dialogue and reconciliation process. And I think it's precisely due to their violent past that prisoners, uh, uh, combatants, etc., are in a very good position to make an active contribution to the uh, peace process. Uh, sorry, uh, Veronique, we have an interpreter requesting that you speak a little more slowly. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, they must be a bit tired, these poor interpreters. Anyway, as I was saying, uh, due to their uh, violent past, uh, many of these participants should be involved in actively contributing to building the, the peace and addressing the consequences of uh, past conflict. Uh, I hope that this process can be possible.
Who else would like to take the floor, please? Any other comments? I haven't heard from you in a while, Brian. Uh, you wish to take the floor? Yeah, very, very briefly. I mean, I, I just feel I'm so far removed from the processes. I haven't been in Europe now probably for two years, which is somewhat depressing. Um, I must, to be honest, I'm not optimistic about either the Spanish government or the French government actively engaging on the consequences of violence, uh, consequences of the violence post-conflict. Post um, I can't for one moment, with what I know at the moment, which I think is probably relatively limited, imagine that the Spanish government is going to put its hand up and start engaging on issues around prisoners. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not optimistic about that. I think there's a much better chance of France, but I would like to ask those of you who are much closer. Um, and I ask the question because for me, there always needs to be a strategy. Things don't just happen on their own. And is there any strategy currently um, being implemented um, or at least designed within the Basque country, both north and south, around finding ways and means of getting the French to begin to engage on issues um, relating to the consequences, particularly around prisoners? Uh, we certainly tried during the sort of late stages to, uh, to get the French to engage uh, on, on prisoner issues. But is there a strategy underway currently, as I say, within the Basque country, North and South, to, to try and entice one or both governments to engage? Yushu, est-ce que tu réponds ou est-ce que... Non, non, vas-y, vas-y. Va, si. <rire> je ne sais pas ce que je suis habilitée à dire. Euh, tout ce que je peux dire, c'est que des rencontres ont lieu régulièrement euh, avec le gouvernement, mais qui sont à ce jour sous silence, euh, sur les prisonniers. Un certain nombre de rapprochements ont été faits depuis, notamment dans ces deux dernières années. Pour autant, les avancées ne sont pas suffisantes et on voit bien qu'aujourd'hui, on est devant un blocage, notamment sur… Some progress has been made over the past couple of years. There are blockages uh, concerning the prisoners that have been uh, uh, sentenced to very long sentences uh, in France. Uh, many of them have been in prison for more than 30 years. So there is a specific uh, operation underway uh, with the view to changing the conditions of these three people, but for the time being, it's a no dialogue situation, so we haven't even managed to open the door. That said, uh, uh, the uh, regulations concerning the prisoners are changing a little bit, but concerning these three prisoners, we have not yet managed to have a positive answer. I can't say more because obviously we are trying to uh, maintain a uh, confidential channel of communication uh, with the Ministry of Justice. D'autres remarques Any other comments La question, c'est en plus des prisonniers qui est majeur, évidemment. Uh, the issue of prisoners is, of course, a major one, and, of course, uh, knowing what the next steps to be taken uh, are. I think, of course, uh, uh, there is a collective role to be played in defining these steps and what the next... Uh, what the evolution should be, what the strategy is going to be. Basically, we have the issue of prisoners, but it's not uh, just that. There's also a new pay. I can't hear uh, Joshua. Please turn on your mic. Joshua speaking. Well, as we said, uh, there are different uh, steps over the last few months uh, by the Spanish and French uh, states uh, concerning prisoners very little uh, as regards the uh, Basque country itself, uh, but uh, not enough. 
and of course a lot remains. Uh, there are many prisoners, women and men, who are hundreds and hundreds of kilometers away from home. As regards the French government, there is the situation of women who have not been brought closer to home because supposedly there is no uh, prison that fulfills the conditions near the Basque country. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, of course, uh, they should be offered the choice to leave, and many of them have preferred staying where they are rather than being detained in conditions that are not uh, uh, proper. In any case, I think a major step uh, still needs to be taken on the side of the French government as regards uh, saying, oh, we've spoken to the prisoners and they didn't want to move. So. Uh, uh, if you have uh, political prisoners, uh, then uh, you don't have to talk about it anymore. That's not the case. Uh, these prisoners are uh, coming from uh, Spain. Someday they will uh, end uh, their uh, sentences or they will be extradited to Spain. So uh, these will remain uh, women and men who are French uh, citizens. Uh, uh, we have the case of Arancha, for example, who has just left prison due to the fact that she finished her sentence in full. Uh, we will soon have another case, uh, Didier Auger, uh, who will also leave prison, having concluded his sentence as well. He served his sentence. Uh, so there is no sentence that has even been shortened in spite of the many requests uh, for humanitarian reasons. So uh, in the uh, present situation, there are people who have been in prison for 30 years, and we might wonder... Uh, whether they're still even there, uh, due to the fact that they are French citizens. So in the case of Esnal, if he happened to be in a Spanish prison, he would already be out. It's clear. Well, that's uh, what we've told our government. Yes, it's uh, shameful. So that's why they're still in jail. I'd like to point out that I do not uh, work for the government uh, by any means, etc. Yes, uh, no, I'm not saying that uh, no i'm just describing the situation no but you're saying it's uh, very much the case and that's uh, exactly what the dialogue is about that's the problem in any case uh, there is a certain attitude on the part of the uh, attorney general which is not uh, the uh, attitude on same basset attitude on both sides you cannot of course separate uh, the attitude of uh, the uh, government or those in uh, political power from the attitude of the uh, Attorney General because they are hand in hand. Well, that would be the conclusion. Well, I think the conclusion, as uh, Veronique said and Caroline said, the uh, conclusion is that we need to push in all of these directions and work on them. Obviously, we need to work on the political level and we need increased and stronger support by civil society. We have seen already the uh, steps uh, that you've taken, the work you've done that has been described. And of course, uh, we still need to get the international community involved in as well, the three. Frédéric speaking, I had a question concerning the negotiations with the Zapatero government. Uh, uh, and even uh, before that, uh, what uh, prevented the Zapatero government uh, from uh, continuing along the lines that it had initially accepted, uh, accepted to negotiate uh, a bit more than others? So. Uh, why not uh, request his involvement in uh, this particular circumstance? Answer, well, I don't really know. I think he's uh, sort of uh, out. <laughs> uh, uh, he might even be out within his own party. Uh, yes, well, but nevertheless, it could be a means of uh, approaching and uh, could be urgent for some people to benefit from that support. Would anybody else like to take the floor? Uh, Veronique, uh, yes, uh, Frédéric, you spoke about the role of youth and uh, how young people in the Basque country, France and Spain, have a contribution to make and uh, they have seen their elders uh, uh, suffer from violence and its consequences and I think it's uh, of interest to see what can be done. I'd also like to, of course, uh, do a bit of uh, advertising too, since my own organization will be holding a, a debate of young people and we will have a Basque contribution to this uh, discussion at uh, the Bergdorf Foundation. So uh, uh, I hope that many of you will participate in this debate. Yes, I think that's where the hope lies. Uh, it lies in youth that needs to build the day of tomorrow, the future. I remember in 2011, 
I used to think, how can we get young people uh, to not take up arms? It's the responsibility of our generation and the commitment that we have made uh, for a choice. It, we made a very hard choice that wasn't easy for organizations. And how do we ensure that this never happens again and that it happens on a definitive basis? However, of course, it is youth that needs to build the day of tomorrow. And we are working for them now, today, here. Uh, all of them have responsibilities. Uh, someone had said to me, uh, all of us are, of course, just in transit. But that's true, of course. But in any case, the youth of uh, this territory needs to be as peaceful as possible, harmonious, and of course, uh, with a number of values and uh, possibilities open. Yes, uh, before we conclude, uh, let me say something that is of great importance to me. And that is that I've always uh, trusted the youth. However, there is a key aspect there. And that is the uh, conveying onward to the young people uh, the experience that we have lived to. Yes, that is obviously the role that all of us should play. Yes, absolutely, you're right. It's responsibilities on every side. So I just wanted to let you know we have a uh, break. Uh, we'll continue at 16.30. The, the situation in uh, Colombia, we have an MP from uh, the Vienne region of France on the Foreign Affairs Commission uh, and the National Assembly discussing the subject of Colombia. We will have people in the round uh, table. Uh, Sergio Emilio Caro, Sergio Caramillo Caro, we have uh, Eduardo Pizzano, Maria Eva Vives, and Ivo Lebot participating on the session about Colombia. See you all back here at 16.30 with Jean-Michel Clément. Thank you all for your participation.